Oi pessoal, eu sou o Paulo Alves, editor do InfoMoney, e esse aqui é o Crypto Mais, o nosso programa semanal para você que quer saber tudo sobre Bitcoin e outros ativos digitais. Hoje a gente tem um programa especial, uma entrevista com o americano Jimmy Song, ele que é escritor, desenvolvedor, evangelista de Bitcoin, aí uma das principais referências do mundo sobre a criptomoeda. No papo que eu tive com ele uns dias atrás, ele contou para a gente o que, que ele espera do Bitcoin, como é que ele acha que a criptomoeda vai se recuperar de toda essa crise e, claro, qual é a opinião dele sobre o caso FTX, que abalou os mercados aí desde novembro, quando a Exchange pediu falência lá nos Estados Unidos e deixou aí cerca de um milhão de pessoas sem o seu dinheiro que estava aí depositado na corretora. Além disso, o Jimmy Song foi polêmico mais uma vez sobre o Ethereum, ele que se diz um maximalista de Bitcoin, ou seja, que acredita que apenas essa criptomoeda é a que merece ter o investimento uh, uh, do investidor, ele criticou o Ethereum dizendo que ela é uma shitcoin, que é um termo aí pejorativo para uh, denominar criptomoedas que não merecem a atenção uh, do investidor. Ele disse que o Ethereum ele funciona sobre um sistema de confiança similar ao da FTX e da FTT, a exchange e o token do Sam Bankman-Fried, que uh, colapsaram nos últimos dias. Segundo ele, nada impediria que algo como o colapso da FTX também acontecesse com o Ethereum no futuro próximo. Ele criticou Vitalik Buterin, ele criticou um monte de gente, e claro, no final deu a sua previsão para o Bitcoin aí até o próximo halving, lá para 2024. Confira o papo. Então, pessoal, hoje a gente tem aqui a ilustre presença do Jimmy Song, que é desenvolvedor, evangelista de Bitcoin, empreendedor e autor de quatro livros sobre a criptomoeda. So, hi, Jimmy. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, so, you've experienced so many bear markets before, right? So, how do you categorize the one you saw in 2022? Would you say it was the worst you've seen so far? No, not at all. No, the worst was like 2011, when it fell something like 96%. Um, You know, this one is what, like, uh, I think on the order of 78%, 80% somewhere in there. It's actually the mildest in terms of percentage decline that we've had uh, in Bitcoin. So it, it's, it's, not, it's not that bad. Um, and that's, uh, you know, the, the perception is that it's always sort of like the worst right now. Uh, kind of like with every election, people say it's the most important election of our lifetime. It's, it's never really like that. It's, you know, it, people just have a recency bias and that's, that's why. Sure. So we had so far three major uh, uh, crypto crises this year, right? So first Luna, then Three Arrows, and more recently FTX. So I guess I would like to, to know what's your take on this all FTX case? I mean, it's, uh, it's fiat money gone crazy, right? Like uh, you, you had a lot of people that didn't know anything about this industry just sort of investing in FTX sort of out of FOMO. Um, and, you know, we expect that from retail investors, but to see it from, um, you know, sort of VCs and hedge funds and things like that, especially, you know, people, you know, very venerated VCs like Sequoia, it, it was it was a little bit shocking in that regard. But, uh, you know, we, we've seen this all play out before. Um, You know, when you, whenever you have a lot of money that's looking to invest in things, you get you get ridiculous like this. Um, you know, VCs always complain about how there's so few things to invest in. Uh, it's it's because of the insane amount of money printing that's been happening. Um, you know, we're we're getting tightening right now, which is kind of what exposed the bank bankruptcy. Um, if there was quantitative easing that continued, then uh, I don't, I, I think FTX could have gone on for another two years or so, but because we're getting quantitative tightening and just sort of, you know, there, there's less money supply available, um, you're, you're getting to see who's swimming naked. Um, and, you know, I expect to see more before it's done. You know, there's, a lot of companies in trouble at the moment. And I, I think, uh, I think that's a good thing. You, you need to, you know, uh, clear out all of the fraud and scams before like another bull market can happen. So, you know, that, that, that's kind of where we are right now. So you do see this is spreading to other companies. What, what more of those are on the way? Did you see more of those companies, those kind of uh, bankrupt things going in the way? Yeah, I mean, uh, you're, you're hearing weird things about Genesis and DCG and even Coinbase, you know, they're, they're, 
the you know weird sort of rumors going around all of these and it's not a surprise because they uh, most of these companies just was, was spent way too much money during the bull market you know um uh, I mean, to take Coinbase as an example, I think uh, after their most recent round of layoff, they, layoffs, they still have 5,000 employees. And these are all people, you know, headquartered in San Francisco. This is not a, you know, th those employees aren't cheap. So, you know, roughly $200,000 a person that ends up being like a billion dollars a year just in, you know, uh, labor that they have to pay out. Um, last I saw, they had like six billion dollars on their balance sheet. A couple of things don't go their way. You know, they they're gonna have to cut way more. So, you know, uh, th this is what happens when you have the excesses of a uh, boom market. Is that people overhire? They, um, you know, think the party's gonna go on forever, and it doesn't. And you know, uh, there's a cleansing that needs to happen. A lot of really dumb money came into the space uh into really dumb companies and those dumb companies need to go away before you can have new companies that are built up and so on um and you know we don't have bailouts in bitcoin so um yeah, that's a, that's a good thing uh, a lot of these companies that deserve to get wrecked are getting wrecked so yeah that's that's what i'm expecting so you had some strong words to say uh, to Vitalik Buterin recently in Argentina, right, about Ethereum, called Ethereum a shit coin. Uh, can, can you explain to us the reasoning behind it? Yeah, it's it's really very simple. Uh, Ethereum is centralized, and uh, you know because of the centralization, you need to trust the people that are in charge. And uh, you know the great Nixabo said a while back that trusted third parties are security holes, and that's what I was pointing out during that panel is that Vitalik himself is a trusted third party for anyone that holds Ethereum. Um, you know, we uh, a lot of the lesson in stuff like FTX is you need to hold your own keys, but on the Ethereum network, even if you do hold your own keys, you still are in many ways trusting in Vitalik uh, to do right by you. Um, he can uh, screw you over if he wants to. And if you doubt that, like go look up what the DAO hack was in 2016 and what happened there. So, I mean, um, you know, if you have centralization, if you're forced to trust somebody, it's not really self-sovereign money. And, uh, you know, Bitcoin's the only one that's actually self-sovereign, where you can, uh, you're you don't have third-party risks uh, like FTX or Vitalik or you know whoever, um, and that that's what I was pointing out. If if you need to trust somebody else, you know, other than yourself, then then that's it's not the money's not really yours, is it? Yeah, but uh, would you say that something uh, like we saw? with FTX could eventually mm -hmm. uh, uh, happen with Ethereum. Is that what you're saying? Well, so think about FTX, right? They had their own token, FTT. And, uh, you know, even if you held your own keys on FTT, you still lost a tremendous amount of money because in a sense, you you were exposed to uh, risk uh, through a trusted third party, Sam Bankrupt Creed. Um, it didn't matter if you held the coins on FTX or held the FTT token, it's, it's still the same sort of trust model that you have to have. Uh, and what I'm pointing out with Ethereum is that, you know, they might not be an exchange, but you still have this counterparty risk that, uh, you know, that's endemic. And it, this is very, like, this should be very familiar to all of the viewers of, uh, uh, of your channel. The, you know, if, if you live in Latin America, you, you know exactly what kind of risk that is. If you, if you hold the Argentinian peso, you're essentially trusting the Argentinian central bank. If you hold the Brazilian real, you're trusting the Brazilian central bank. And there's a reason why a lot of people in different countries would rather hold the US dollar. In a sense, they're trusting the Federal Reserve more than their own central bank. But it's it's all still a game of trust. Uh, you, as If you're having to trust somebody, then it's not really your money. And, uh, and that's the same thing with Ethereum, Ripple, you know, Cardano or whatever, is that you are outsourcing your trust to somebody else. And as soon as you do that, it's uh, you're you're not really sovereign over your own wealth. And, you know, um, this is why, you know, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. And people tell me that because in a sense, like that, this is the only one uh, 
of these digital things that's actually self-sovereign. You don't have to trust anybody. You verify everything yourself. And that, that's the big difference. And that's the big lesson that I hope people get out of this because, you know, uh, using an exchange and holding, holding your crypto there or whatever is, you know, is essentially the same as trusting, you know, the founder of a currency or whatever. And, um, you know, with FTX, you saw that very clearly, um, not just with their exchange, but with the FTC token. Uh, okay, but with Bitcoin, would you, would you say that, it, in a sense, Bitcoin uh, holders should also, uh, in some extent, trust Satoshi as well, whoever he or she is? Uh, or no, it's completely different. How, 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 what's your take? Yeah, well, it's, it's different because one, Satoshi is not around. And two, you can look at the code and you can run a node yourself. And what the, the unique thing about Bitcoin is that it's com always backwards compatible. It's always a soft work. Uh, so you don't have to change uh, the software you're running if you don't want to. You only do it if you do it voluntarily. And, uh, and by running your own software, you verify absolutely everything. You're not trusting anybody. Um, if, uh, if you give me, you know, 0.1 Bitcoin or something like that, I can verify it using my own node. I don't have to trust, um, you know, Amazon Web Services or Block Explorer or anything like that. I can verify completely that it came to me and that I, I, I am in possession of it. And only then do I, uh, you know, do I give you the good or service for that amount of money? Um, so, you know, that that's a wonderful thing. That's that that's what makes Bitcoin uh, so amazing is that you have the ability to verify things yourself. I mean, try try verifying stuff at the Brazilian Central Bank. You're not going to be able to. Uh, you know, you, you know, we uh, we in the U.S. have been trying to audit the Fed forever, and you know, like it's stonewall after stonewall. You you're not going to be able to verify any of that. Um, and I, neither can you for, you know, any of these hard forks. You, you have no guarantees on what the next hard fork is going to bring. Uh, if Vitalik wants to, you know, change the emission schedule so that it's 100x what it is now, he can. Um, and he's changed the monetary policy many times with Ethereum. And all these other cryptos have done the same. They, they can and do change the monetary policy on a regular basis. Um, and that's that's not any different than a central bank uh that uh whereas with bitcoin you know exactly the emission schedule you know exactly the rules and you know that it'll always be backwards compatible so yeah you know, uh you're 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 always going to have this um uh self-sovereignty where owning other cryptos you're not so but um Ethereum, it's uh, uh, most of Ethereum is about DeFi, right? Well, yeah, it, it does a lot of things, but DeFi could be maybe maybe the main thing. Um, do you see DeFi becoming a, a mainstream uh, a thing in the world? And uh, would you say Bitcoin needs to do DeFi to 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 have success? <laughs> Absolutely not. I, I think DeFi is a complete scam. It's uh, it's and and you can kind of see it. It's it's all sort of like yield farming and weird stuff that's based on the token. It, it, there's a really good article that Alan Farrington wrote a while back. Only the strong survive, which goes into okay, what what exactly is this stuff and what what's it based on? It's it's a house of cards. There's a reason why it's so down right now and. For me, it's it's no different than any altcoin or you know, the ICO boom from like five years ago, or you know uh, you know this Web three narrative or whatever. And you know you 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 said earlier that uh, DeFi is what you know defines Ethereum. It wasn't always right. They change their narrative every every six months or so. Uh, currently, it's Web three, and I'm sure at some point it'll be the metaverse or something like that. But th this is this has been sort of their pattern is continuing to change the narrative and uh, make it seem like something that it's not. Uh, it's it's always all, all about the token and speculation and uh, enriching the insiders, the issuers of the token at the expense of retail. And retail has suffered quite a bit, right? Like uh, all all of these tokens have gone down like 90, 95 percent. Um, I, I saw a statistic the other day about like the number of coins issued on Uniswap, something like 97.7% of them were straight rug pulls. I mean, that, that tells you that this is a scam vehicle, not, not anything 
interesting or creating new anything. It's not, it's not a new good or service. It's the worst of Wall Street uh, and the worst of, you know, um, sort of token issuance combined. And it, it's, it's, you know, you get a lot of people being getting hurt, a lot of people losing money. Um, and, you know, the, uh, the Vitalik's and the Kyle Samani's of the world get rich on, you know, on the money that you're providing them. Okay, so back with Bitcoin then. We've seen uh, so far mixed responses after the FTX collapse, right? So on one hand, many people got their Bitcoin out of exchanges and finally learning uh, self-custody. But the other hand, uh, uh, in places like Brazil, for example, many people just lost their faith in crypto in general, including Bitcoin, after having lost so much money. Uh, I guess my question would be, uh, how do you see Bitcoin recovering from this crisis? Well, I, I mean, it, it's recovered the same way it's always recovered, which is, you know, you, you have a down cycle when a lot of people are down on it, mostly because of all coins and stupid stuff that happens around that. Uh, but, you know, uh, the more you study Bitcoin, uh, the more it's obvious that this is your only hope to get out from under the fiat monetary system. Um, you know, I think it's Michael Saylor that said anyone that's put in like 30, 40 hours of investigation into Bitcoin, like there's no one that's come out and said, ah, th this is a bunch of crock or whatever. The more you study it, the, the more convinced you get. And bear markets are, I think, when people actually really get convinced of Bitcoin's utility rather than all these altcoins or whatever. It, it's going to take some time. It always does. But um but you know, during this uh, this bear market, you know, it, it, it'll Bitcoin will do what it's always done, which is, you know, um, go uh, make more holders, and it'll it'll continue to rise because, you know, it, it's a it's a better form of money, um, and you know, it's down right now, but you know that that was true, you know, in the last bear market too. It, it, this is just how things go. Do you see CBDCs menacing uh, uh, Bitcoin in any way? I mean, I think it's uh, it's the elite's way of trying to get almost like Orwell, like 1984-ish, like uh, you know, powers over people. Um, you know, it's obviously there for surveillance and uh, you know, doing sort of monetary games that they can't do now. Um, you know, what, one of the ideas that they have is. All right, you have to spend this money in the next uh, month, or we're going to take it away. That sort of thing, as a way to do stimulus. I I think this, it, it's going to be a complete disaster. Um, Bitcoin is your way out. So in that sense, I think it's going to be good for Bitcoin because as soon as CBDCs come, this will be the alternate uh, alternative that people will be flocking to because people don't like being surveilled people don't like being forced to spend their money and stuff like that they'd rather save um and there will always be sort of uh, uh you know a market for that and i uh you know bring it on like i i you know somebody's gonna try it probably china and i will bet you anything that it will become very popular in china because there are lots of chinese people that don't want everything tracked how do you see initiatives like the one in El Salvador just uh, kind of forcing businesses to accept Bitcoin? Do you, don't you think it's a bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a controversy there uh, regarding Bitcoin's, you know, uh, sense of of being freed? Well, I, this is sort of like the narrative against El Salvador that everyone gives is, oh, this is a legal tender. I mean, remember, this is something that every government has done everywhere, right? In, in Brazil, if you don't take the real, then you are breaking the law. If you're forcing people to pay in some other currency, that's a legal tender. This is something that every country in the world does. Um, and in El Salvador, they had the dollar as their legal tender as because they, they don't have their own central bank. And, um, you know, you can either take legal tender status away from the dollar or to raise Bitcoin to that. So this was a way to sort of even it out. I, 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 I honestly think it's, uh, it's sort of like, um, uh, you know, journalists and people sort of like putting FUD into El Salvador. I, I mean, honestly, like every country has legal tender laws. 
And it's, uh, you know, if, if you're going to complain about uh, Bitcoin being legal tender in El Salvador, like show me where you were complaining about legal tender laws in every other country in the world before this this thing. Uh, otherwise, it, you're, you're just sort of like spouting FUD and saying, oh, you know, uh, the, it, this shouldn't be. Yeah. In an ideal world, it shouldn't be. But first, uh, show me your work. Show me that you, you're against legal tender laws in the first place on everything else. Uh, because, you know, that, that, that's clearly the case everywhere else. It, it, it just smacks of uh, sort of like opportunistic FUD uh, from the opponents of Bitcoin or the opponents of El Salvador to me. And yeah, I, I find that like horribly disingenuous. So uh, the, all this FTX collapse uh, mm -hmm. just already sparked in many discussions around regulation, right? And so mm -hmm. everybody's expecting that 2023 will be a regulation year for crypto in general and probably, well, uh, uh, including Bitcoin. Uh, do you do you see regulation a bad thing for Bitcoin? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a libertarian, so I'm in general, I'm against regulation, period. But here's what I think will happen. Um, I, I, I think you're right that there will be more regulation around this stuff, um, especially, uh, you know, in places that got hurt by the FTX stuff. Uh, it, it'll be sort of a rallying cry. And of course, lawmakers always have to make a law whenever something goes wrong. Never mind that, you know, like if they just enforced all the, you know, uh, laws against fraud, then FTX never would have happened. But and never mind that they they feel this need to go do something, um, but there there will probably be regulation, and uh, and I think that that's probably going to mean the death of a lot of these altcoins, um, and and that's simply because there's no way that they're going to be able to, uh, you know, um, comply with all of the different laws that that are going to come to pass. Uh, you, even in the U.S., uh, something like, um, you know, Gary Gensler has been saying, you know, Ethereum is a security now that they're proof of uh, stake. You know, that, that's a big deal. Now, uh, Ethereum is going to, if that sort of ruling holds or that regulation passes, then they're going to have to, uh, first of all, like provide a lot of financial statements, which none of these things are doing. Uh, a lot, a lot of the this stuff will get delisted off of exchanges, so there's going to be no liquidity. A lot of this stuff, um, you know, they, they'll just be in violation. The, uh, you know, probably get seized, stuff like that. So a lot of this stuff is going to die. Now, uh, Bitcoin, I don't think will be regulated away because there's uh, going to be a market for it because it is decentralized. It's not going to be as simple as, you know, going and asking Vitalik to do X, Y, or Z like we can with Ethereum. Uh, so I think Bitcoin will survive, maybe even thrive as a result of regulation. Uh, but all coins, I, I see them definitely suffering quite a bit. Um, they're already suffering quite a bit, right? Like a lot of this stuff is down 95%, like I said. Uh, but, you know, I, I think there's even further to go and, you know, at a certain point, you're not going to have any liquidity and that's, that's how all coins really die. They don't go to zero. It's just, there's nowhere to trade it. And, uh, and, you know, if you doubt me, go look up what happened to something like Bitcoin private or, you know, Bitcoin interest or something like that. There's no liquidity because you can't trade it anywhere. And that's, that's what happens to coins and, uh, you know, if there's regulation, then exchanges are going to have to delist a lot of this stuff. Okay, so we've seen in the past the price of Bitcoin just going up prior to the halving, right? So, mm -hmm. but I don't think it ever experienced such a challenging macro scenario. So there's less money around. Do you still see this uh, four-year uh, Bitcoin cycle intact? How do you see Bitcoin's price uh, by the next halving 2024? Well, usually the uh, the bull market starts with the halving and then it continues over like the next year or so. But at least that's been the pattern. Uh, now, is, is is the halving stuff going to matter? Um, I mean, I think it does uh, because you're you're going to get a supply shock. Um, but there's always two sides to any price, which is supply and demand. Um, we know what the supply is going to be. We know the schedule and everything else. But the demand side is the Part that's really hard to predict. And that's kind of what you're alluding to, which is that from a macroeconomic perspective, is there going to be enough demand for Bitcoin? And my guess is yes. Um, 
Now, the quantitative tightening is not going to happen forever. Um, there, there are just way too many consequences to raising interest rates too far uh, that, that governments aren't going to be able to deal with. Uh, so if you have you know, 10% interest rates or whatever, that's also the interest rate you're going to have to pay on your treasuries as, as they roll over. They, they can't really do that for very long. Uh, it, you know, if, if it's like even 5%, if, if, uh, pay, interest payments become, you know, the biggest budget item in the U.S. Uh, uh, budget. Um, for other countries, it's going to be much more and so on. So uh, I, I don't think uh, quantitative tightening is going to last. And second, uh, as you alluded to before, uh, CBDCs are, I think, going to create demand for Bitcoin uh, because people are not going to like surveillance and they're not going to like being forced to spend and so on. So they're going to go to something that's actually, you know, uh, a good store of value. So um, for both those reasons, um, you know, and, you know, given the supply shock that uh, that is that part is certain that that I think will, you know, uh, spur some uh, some something of a bull market. Ok, uh, so, então pessoal, eu conversei aqui com o Jimmy Song, um dos maiores especialistas em Bitcoin do mundo. Thank you so much, Jimmy. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Então pessoal, esse foi o nosso papo com o Jimmy Song, um dos maiores especialistas em Bitcoin do mundo. Deixa, por favor, aqui nos comentários o que você achou das falas do Jimmy Song sobre o Ethereum, sobre a FTX e, claro, sobre o Bitcoin. Você concorda com ele de que a criptomoeda vai finalmente se recuperar aí nos próximos meses e vai deixar para trás todas essas crises de 2022? Deixa sua opinião aqui embaixo que a gente quer saber. E, claro, espera a gente que na próxima segunda-feira tem outro criptomático com uma entrevista muito interessante com o pessoal da AgroToken, que é uma empresa que está transformando commodities em criptomoedas e deixando você, por exemplo, abastecer o carro com uma saca de soja. Que estranho isso, né? Mas eu espero que você goste. A gente vai trazer uma entrevista especial com eles na próxima segunda. Eu espero todo mundo lá. Até mais.